Hello, no kako. This is Kenson again coming to you from the beautiful island of Maui in the middle of the Pacific. Well, as you can see from the first slide, the title, I'll be sharing about being touched by Jesus because something miraculous and amazing happens when people are touched by Christ. Their lives change and their priorities change and they want to do something for him. And we'll see that as we look at different people in, in during the time of Christ. And I'm going to even show you an example of someone who was born way before the time Jesus was born. And he was touched by Christ. And we're going to see what happened in his life. But let's go back to the time of Christ, to uh, the period when he's about, about to be uh, baptized. And so we come to this man right here. This is actually Jesus' second cousin. His name, we know him as John the Baptist. And so we read, and John the Apostle records, he says, again, the next day, John the Baptist, the Baptist stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So they were John's disciple, John the Baptist's disciples. But when they saw that John referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God, they left John the Baptist and they began to follow Jesus. And then the transformation starts to happen. We read in the next verse, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. This is the first indication of what you see when a person meets Jesus, when Jesus touches their lives. And here it's, it's mainly in what they had learned from him, because Andrew and the other disciple began to uh, spend time with Christ, and Christ began to talk with them, and what does Andrew think of? The first thing he thinks about is, I got, I've got to tell my brother. So he goes, and the first thing he does is he finds his own brother, Simon. And he tells Simon, we found the Messiah. We found the Christ. And he brings Simon to Jesus. Okay? And then it says here, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. And now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so we have this, we see the same scene taking place the following day in Jesus uh, finding Philip and touching his life and, G and Philip responds by following Christ right here. And Philip goes on uh, uh, to find Nathaniel. He finds him under this tree. And then he tells Nathaniel, we found the one that Moses and the prophet spoke about. And he's none other than Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And uh, of course, if you, you know the story, if you continue reading, how um, Nathaniel doubted at first, but Jesus convinced him fairly quickly that he was the uh, the one that was spoken of by Moses. Well, I could go on and mention so many people, but we can go on to other disciples like James and John that Jesus called, and they responded. They were touched by the words of Christ and by his just his person and his love for them, and they went on to follow him, and James went on to be the first apostle that was martyred. He bore witness to his faith in Christ. John went on to live a long life, writing his gospel, the epistles, as well as the revelation of Christ himself. And so John went on to have a great ministry. And so they followed Christ and they helped others to follow Christ as well. And so it goes, story with the Samaritan woman. When she meets Jesus at Jacob's well, she goes back to the town and tells people 
I have found one who has told me everything that I've ever done. And she spreads the word and she gets these people to come and meet Jesus. Jesus heals the deaf and the mute man. And after he does that, he tells him and the people that were there, he says, don't tell anybody what happened. But what do they do? Of course, they go out and they tell everybody. That's the response. When Jesus touches a people, the first thing they want to do is tell others about him. And this happens again with the leper. Jesus heals the leper and he touches him. This man that nobody ever wants to touch. Jesus touches him literally and figuratively with his word and he heals him. And, and the, the leper is so filled with joy. Jesus says, don't tell anybody about this. But of course he goes and he tells everybody that he meets. So you can see what I'm, the, the theme already of this lesson, that when you're touched by Jesus, you want to touch others with the message of Christ and the person of Christ because he's the mo most amazing person that we have ever met and we've ever been touched by. That is, if you've really been touched by him. And, and one of the most dramatic uh, events of this was this man. His name was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He's first mentioned in the, uh, in the story of the st stoning of Stephen, where it says the Jews took off their cloaks, cloaks and they laid it at the feet of a young man named Saul, none other than Saul of Tarsus. Well, Saul grows up with this hatred for the Christians, and he persecutes them to no end. In fact, he gets permission to go to Damascus so that he can persecute and arrest the Christians there. But on the road to Damascus, he is struck down by a bright light, and he hears the voice of, of the Lord saying, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? And Saul looks up and he sees this blinding light and he said, Who art thou? Who art thou, Lord? And the voice says, I am Jesus. And I'm sure Saul was thinking in his head, Jesus, he's the one that I'm persecuting. You know, and he must have been stunned. Of course, you know the story. And the Lord strikes him blind, tells him to go to Damascus. And a man named Ananias is going to he opened up his eyes again, but that he's going, Jesus says, I'm going to call you to go to the Gentiles. And sure enough, when Saul receives his sight and Barnabas picks him up and disciples him and they go off, Barnabas and Saul, he changes his name to Paul, which is what most people know him as. Saul was the name of the king of Israel, the first king who was head and shoulders above everyone, a tall man. Well, he changes the name to Paul because Paul means small. And, and Paul was very humbled. You know, he was a very learned man. He was a leader among the Jewish leaders. And now he feels so grateful that Jesus touched his life and forgave him for killing Christians and persecuting Christians. And he, he humbles himself and he's willing to do whatever God wants him to do. And so he goes on these missionary journeys and he takes the light of Christ and he takes it and he sets fires all over Asia Minor in these towns that we're familiar with, Lystra, Colossae, Ephesus. And when he gets to Troas, he, uh, he was planning to go eastward and to move into Asia. But the Lord directs him uh, in a dream to go to uh, Macedonia. He gets, he has the dream from the Macedonian. And so he goes to Philippi, Thessalonica, the Bereans, Corinth. And then he, he, he begins to light these fires all over these places, planting churches. And then he goes on a second and then a third missionary journey. And eventually he ends up in Rome, which is where he meets his death. Nero, the Caesar, puts him to death. But not after Paul ignites this part of the world with the gospel. Why? Because he was touched by Christ and his love and his grace. And he was touched by the forgiveness of Christ. And he spread that word this way. 
and the fire ignites Europe and it spreads throughout Europe until Europe becomes the Holy Roman Empire and it jumps the Pacific into the Americas, both North and South. And someone has suggested or others have suggested that the gospel has begun to move westward, uh, the missionaries reaching out to Africa and then into Asia, and it begins to reach around the world until now it's back where it started in Jerusalem and in Israel, reaching the Jews. And uh, the Jews were one of the hardest people to reach, but now the Lord is doing something like a miracle in Israel through ministries like One for Israel that are reaching the Jews using cell phones and, and uh, videos on these cell phones. And people are coming to Christ here. And that's a sign to us as, as Gentile believers that, that the coming of our Lord is soon because the gospel has gone throughout the world and is, it has returned to where it started. And Saul was instrumental. But I'll, tell, I'll, I'll show you another person in scripture that was just as instrumental. And he actually was born 700 years before Jesus himself was born. And this man was Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet. You're familiar with him. But Isaiah is one of the most amazing prophets who shared the gospel in his writings. And in fact, his, his writings it shares the gospel so clearly and so concisely. It is one of the most amazing scriptures that the Jewish leaders and the rabbis would forgive or forbid the Jews from reading. They forbid the Jews from reading at least two chapters in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. They didn't want them to read Daniel chapter 9, from which you could determine the timing of when the Messiah would come, and they didn't want them to read Isaiah chapter 53, which describes the Messiah coming as Savior. And so they forbid the Jewish people from reading those chapters, and because of that, their eyes were blinded, as we're going to see. But let me, see, let me tell you right here, John includes this episode of Isaiah, which is one of the most amazing things that John writes in his gospel because Isaiah lived seven centuries before Jesus. It says, but although Jesus had done so many signs before them, talking about the Jews, especially the Jewish leaders, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled. And then he quotes Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verses 9 and 10. Um, I, I've spoken about these verses just a few days ago in a video I made called Judgment is Imminent. Because when, I, when Isaiah receives this word, it's about the year 742 BC, in the year that Uzziah died, as we're going to see. He receives this word from God, and God tells him to tell the people, he says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that they should be healed. God had basically given up on them because he had sent his prophets to um, turn their hearts to him, to open their eyes to him and his word, but they rejected him. They shut their eyes, they turned their hearts from him, they hardened their hearts, and they would not believe until finally God raises up Isaiah and he says, you know what, Isaiah, go tell them, you know, I've blinded them, I've hardened their hearts, you know, and I've basically given up on them. Because 22 years later, and basically speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel, 22 years later, the Assyrians from the north come and conquer that northern kingdom. And they, they lay it to waste to such an extent that the people are wiped out. So that today we have the phrase, the lost 10 tribes of Israel, referring to, to the aftermath of God's judgment on them with these words. Well, a hundred years later, these words come true for the southern kingdom of Ju Judah, and the Babylonians come down and wipe them out and take them into exile 
destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temples, that's Solomon's temple. And so the, this thing happens again. It's, it's almost like, a, like a, these words are like a harbinger, as Rabbi Jonathan Kahn talks about. It's a, it, when you hear these words, you know the judgment of God is not far behind. Well, John, John here re revises these words. He puts it in his gospel. And he's writing now to the first century Jews. And he says, what's happening in Israel during his time? Because the Jews rejected Christ. He said, it's to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. And then he, qu he quotes this very passage in his gospel in the 12th chapter. And 40 years after Jesus ascends back into heaven, the Romans come, they lay waste to Jerusalem, destroy the second temple, Herod's temple. And so these words again become a harbinger of what's going to happen. And Israel, uh, the Israel proper, both the north and the south, is completely destroyed through the Roman Empire. And I spoke about this in, the, in that message, uh, judgment is imminent. And what I'm saying is that these words are coming true today. Because as, as you can see today, especially in America, and I believe in the in all the Western countries, when 9-11 happened, and by the way, I'm recording this on September 11, 2021, 20 years after the uh, towers were struck down. But when 9-11 happened in, in 2001, it was a sign that God's judgment was imminent. And so we saw that in, initially the people in America began to turn to God. They sang, God bless America, but that dissipated really fast. Until now, 20 years later, you look at America today and you compare it to America back in 2001, 20 years ago, and you look at the, the difference. Has America become more godly or more ungodly? More righteous or more righteous or more unrighteous? Are we following God more? Or are we rejecting him more? I say that these words are unfortunately coming true in, in America. And so I believe God is blinding the eyes of people, hardening the hearts of people here in America, lest they see, lest they understand, lest he, God would heal them. It sounds harsh, but God is basically turning his back. He's basically um, judging America because they have rejected him and his blessings that he has so bountifully bestowed upon this country. And so we're seeing this happen again. And just as we saw the Northern Kingdom Israel fall to their enemies, we saw the Southern Kingdom J Judah fall to their enemy. And then we saw the United Kingdom, again, Israel proper, fall to its enemy, the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago. I believe judgment is imminent on America today because we are rejecting the God that, that blessed us, the God that gave birth to this country, that our founding fathers recognized, gave us these divine rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but that we have taken these rights and we are dashing them and we are rejecting them. We are killing the unborn and we are restricting people's rights. We are taking them away and we are usurping God's power and his authority. And because of this, God is about to judge us as well. And we need to be really careful of that and be, be aware and fall on our knees and repent of this. But some, something tells me that it's too late for America at least. But people themselves can still come to him. Now, that's not the part I wanted to major on, even though I had to say it, because today is such a significant day. You know, 9-11, 2021, 20 years exactly after that day when God showed us just a little piece of the judgment that could come if we turn away from him. So I just had to say that. But the part I really want to concentrate on is, is this part. John said, these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory. Whose glory? Jesus' glory. Because if you follow these pronouns, 
you know, back to the antecedent, you find out he's talking about Jesus. He still is. And so when Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and he spoke of him, so that's why uh, G Isaiah says this thing, because Jesus touched his life 700 before years before Jesus even came on earth you know, and being born in, in Bethlehem. Well, you're saying, when did Isaiah see Jesus, you know? Where, where is that in Scripture? And when did he speak of him? Well, let's go back and let's look in Isaiah. In fact, this I told you this passage right here comes from Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. If you go to the beginning of that chapter, starting at verse 1, we got this passage right here. Isaiah chapter 6, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. There you have it. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Why is this? Because as we read, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. I'm going to stop here. We're going to continue on, but I'm going to stop here for now. But I think you might have noticed, here's the word Lord again. Here it is. We set it up here. Now, Isaiah saw the Lord here, but here it's mentioned again. The angels are seeing this word right here. Same word, same spelling, but they're different, right? You notice that. All in caps here, not in caps, all in caps here. What's the difference? Well, you probably know that when it's not all in caps, this word in the English refers to the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord, equivalent to the Greek word kurios, which is the word they use to refer to Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Hebrew, the word Lord is Adonai. But here the angels speak this word, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the translators put this word Lord only because the Hebrew word here is not it's not Adonai. It's it's the uh, tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav the, the word that we translate normally as Yahweh or Jehovah or Jehovah. Or, there's various ways, but because we don't really know the vowels there, and people didn't speak that word because it's the name of God himself. And the commandment said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The uh, The people who would read the scriptures would not read the name. They didn't want to chance offending God and perhaps being struck dead. So instead, they would replace it with this Hebrew word, Adonai. And then the translators of the English Bible followed that pattern, and they would put this word, Lord, over uh, Yahweh, and they would capitalize it all just to indicate that it is that word. But the angels didn't do that. The angels declared that Yahweh, the Lord Jesus, was holy, 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 spoken three times for emphasis to the superlative. Jesus is holy, absolutely, you know, absolutely. And he's the Lord of hosts, the God of heaven. The whole earth which he created is full of his glory. You know, people say, well, if God, if I could see God, then I would believe. Just look at creation. You know, look at creation. Because his, his, his invisible attributes, as Paul writes in Romans 1, and his invisible power is proclaimed in cre creation. In fact, I remember as a young, young guy, I, I was into astronomy. I had telescopes, and I would look at the stars at night, and I, I would always ask myself, who made this thing, you know? Uh, it couldn't, couldn't just come about. I understood the Big Bang Theory, but who really created this thing? And as I was stood, I sat in my uh, biology classes at the university, even that amazed me. You know, this can't come about strictly by chance, evolution. 
somebody made these things and God heard my yearning and he led me to himself. And so here, Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw Jesus. We're going to read that, that uh, Jesus touched him and when we continue to read. And so Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am undone. It's kind of like uh, um, when Paul, in, in Romans chapter 7, he, he says a similar thing, you know. Wretched man that I am is how Paul puts it, you know. I, I'm done. I'm undone. That's what Paul is saying. Woe is me, Isaiah says, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner, you know. And because of that, I am judged and I'm guilty. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I mean, not only am I a sinner, but all of us are sinners. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord, Yahweh of hosts. And he's speaking about Jesus again. And then Isaiah writes, One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. The altar is pure, holy fire. You know? And so you see in this, in this picture, the angel takes this fiery em ember from the uh, altar and he says, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin forgiven. And here we see Jesus touches Isaiah. And he touches him in the very place that Isaiah says he is so unclean, his lips. And so Jesus takes his iniquity away and his sin is forgiven. So Isaiah is touched. And what does Isaiah do? Well, as we read, he saw the Lord's glory and then he begins to speak about him. And, you know, Isaiah is, is an Old Testament prophet, but he is one of the greatest preachers of the gospel ever from scripture because this is one passage he writes in isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace you're very familiar with this passage this is a, we, we say it's a Christmas passage, but it comes from Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was even born. Isaiah saw the Lord and he writes about him. He writes about Jesus in his, in his uh, prophecies. He talks about Jesus. And if, if anyone doubts that Jesus is God, take them to this verse right here, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, because this child this son, the government will be given to him. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here it is. The Lord or the Bible is calling the Lord Jesus Mighty God and Everlasting Father. No question about it. Jesus is God himself. But then he writes on because he, had, he has been touched by Christ. And he writes the most uh, incredible description of Jesus ever, even in a way more than the New Testament writers. And he writes it down in this chapter that I spoke about that the uh, Jewish teachers and rabbis didn't want the people to really study. And it's Isaiah 53. And he writes that he, and uh, I, I know the rabbis would say, well, this refers to Israel, but no. It refers to the coming Messiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. What, there is no better description for Jesus than this, this sentence right here. Jesus was a man of sorrows. Why? Because he knew why he was, he was sent. He knew his destiny. He would go, go to the cross and carry the sins of all mankind and he was familiar with suffering because he was despised and rejected like one from whom men hide their faces he was despised 
and we esteem them not. Can you imagine? Maybe you have experienced that, that people hide their faces from you, that they despise you, that they look look down upon you. Well, if if you you know what it feels like, surely Jesus knows what it feels like because he was despised and people didn't esteem him. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So the people thought that Jesus was being afflicted. Bad things were happening to him because of his sins. But Isaiah writes, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, is there any better description of what took place on this cross than what Isaiah writes 700 years before it took place? Isaiah saw the Lord. He was touched by the Lord. And so he writes about the Lord. And he writes one of the most amazing gospel presentations he will ever find. You can preach the gospel from Isaiah alone. And it asks people to believe in this, that Jesus died for their sins, that he was pierced, he was crushed for their iniquities, he was punished for them, and it's by his wounds we are healed. We can be healed if we would believe him and receive him as our Lord. And so if we go back to um, Isaiah chapter 6. We've read that the angel came and brought God's touch to Isaiah, touched his lips with that coal from the pure holy altar. And the uh, Lord tells him that this has touched your lips. Your sins are forgiven. And then this final verse I want you to see. And then Isaiah writes, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. This again, the response of people who are touched by God, they want to go and spread the word of what Jesus has done. He heals, he forgives, and he touches people and makes them whole. You know, if you've been touched by Jesus and you've experienced that, this would be your response. Isn't that true? I remember the first time I heard this. This was back in, in 1972. The winter of 1972, almost 50 years ago, I was, uh, the Lord brought me to this camp. I wasn't really a Christian yet. You know, I, I had been going to this Campus Crusade training, but I, I had heard later on that the staff guy that was meeting with me had become fed up with me because I kept asking him questions and I was driving him crazy. And so later on, I found out that he was just about ready to say, Kenson, I don't want to meet with you anymore. This is it. I've had it with you. Uh, I'm going my way. You go your way. You want to, you want to reject Christ, it's up to you. And he was ready to uh, you know, just leave and you know, just tell me to go away, basically. He, he had told me about the camp, but he didn't really tell me to go. But I had heard about it, and the Lord brought me to this camp. And so I went to this camp, and there I listened to this uh, speaker. His name was Elmer Lappin. He was an older man. He was probably in his 50s at that time. And he was the campus director at the Arizona, Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. And he came, and he was, he was a crippled, really, from arthritis. So he was always in a wheelchair, and that's where he spoke from. And that really spoke to me, that this man who was in constant pain would speak so amazingly about God and about what God had done in his life. And he gave, basically, his testimony. And there at that retreat, I, I looked at my life. My life was empty. You know, there were, I had no purpose in my life. And, and I had always wanted to know, why am I here? I had gone after, I had been involved with the SDS movement, 
Students for a Democratic Society. I went on their sittings, their marches, their demonstrations. We took over the campus. You know, I was in the sitting, uh, sit-in where we took over the president's office and we blocked his door. You know, we took over that place. And, uh, but later on, I realized that these leaders in the SDS were crazy, that they were dictatorial. And I knew that if this country were ever ruled by people like that, we would be in trouble. Now, it took a while, but eventually that SDS people took over this country and they're in control right now in fact. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. But I left that group because I knew that, that they didn't have the answer. They didn't have the answer. And the Lord drew me to this Christian ministry on campus. Even though I gave the staff guy a hard time because I had so many questions, but the Lord drew me to this retreat. And I had to ask myself, this, is this the answer? And I knew in my heart, Yes, it was, because Jesus was a leader like no other. He led by love, not by force, by grace, not by fear. And so I said, this is a leader worth following. I want him in my life. And I knew who I was like, like Isaiah. I am a man of unclean lips. I had done terrible things. And there I found forgiveness. And Jesus touched my life so that when the final uh, final meeting occurred and Elmer Lappin gave this challenge, this very challenge to us and he, he made us uh, sit there in our seats and he said, God is telling you and he's asking you, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he's challenging us with this question, who will go for us? And Elmer Lappin told the, all of us as campers, he said, are you willing to stand where you are and say, here, my Lord, send me. Give your life completely to Christ. Be willing to go wherever he sends you. And you know, I sat there and I could he hear people standing and they were saying this, here am I, send me. And I looked at my life and I remember a quote that was spoken at the camp. C.T. Studd said, and if Christ be God and died for me, there is nothing too great that I would do for him. And I thought, that's true. If Christ be God and died for me, there's nothing too great that I should be willing to do for him. So I stood and I said, here am I, send me. And you know, God heard, that, heard me say that. And he took me up on that word because six months later, you know, even though I wasn't invited to, to, uh, to apply for staff, they usually take the best. And I, I, I would admit that I wasn't the best. Plus, I was really young as a Christian, right? Like six months. But I really wanted to serve God. And so I, I asked them, can I come to staff training to apply for staff with, with Campus Crusade? And surprisingly, they said, well, you can come. There's no guarantee. But you're going to have to pay your own way to get to Purdue University. So I, had, I, I withdrew all my money from my bank account from my years of summers of working at the uh, uh, picking pineapple and working in the pineapple canneries. Took that money and it was like a guy putting it down on the roulette table, you know, and putting it down on, on one of those squares and saying, I'm going to bet my life to serve the Lord. I'm going to put this money and take the risk uh, whether God will accept me. And so I bought a ticket to West Lafayette, Purdue, and I went to staff training, you know, uh, we went through uh, this biblical studies thing, and but and we but I had to take uh, interviews and uh, you know an analysis to see whether I qualified, and I actually didn't qualify to be on staff. And then the fateful day, they posted the names of people who were accepted to staff. And as I was walking to that building to see the list of names, I could see people coming back, and some of them, in fact, many of them were crying because their names weren't on the list. And I thought, oh man, if these people weren't accepted, surely I won't be either. There were so many good quality people there, like me, applying to staff. So I went there and I looked at the name, you know, and I'm really naive, I'm a young Christian, right? And I looked at the name and amazingly, my name was on there to be accepted to staff. That God in his grace, 
heard me say this at this camp in the, in the winter previously, here am I, send me. And he took me at my word and he accepted me. And he said, I'm going to send you. And uh, five years later, I'm landing at Jackson's airport after spending the previous years on the campus at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Uh, the last two years as campus director of that, of that place, uh, you know, amazingly. But I'm landing at Jackson's airport with my wife and my two-year-old son to start the Campus Crusade Ministry in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. So, you know, if you say this to the Lord, you'll, you, you don't know where he's going to send you. And you have to be willing to go no matter where it is. You know, if you're touched by Christ, you should be willing to go wherever he sends you, right? Even if, if it's like a few days ago, I was in my front yard. And I was, in fact, I was cleaning up the backyard. And then I, as I came to the front, I saw this guy picking flowers from our uh, Pua Kenny Kenny tree, a tree that my, my wife picks flowers to make her lays with. And my wife wasn't here. She's up in Vegas visiting our kids. But I knew that if my wife was here, she would not like, like seeing this guy picking her flowers. So I went up to him and I asked him, what are you doing, you know, picking our flowers? But I had a good conversation with him. The Lord led me to him because I got to share Christ with him. He didn't receive Christ with me, but I got to share with him. I found out that he was actually Jewish, born a Jew, but he, he, he was not following the faith anymore. But I got to share with him his Messiah, you know. So you need to go wherever he sends you and, and share in the opportunities that he gives you. And I want to ask you right now, are you willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me, send me. Have you been touched by Christ? Are you willing and are you wanting to go, go and preach the gospel to others? Say, Lord, send me wherever you want me to go. And you're saying, Kenson, but I don't know how to do things like that. If you go to the description of this video, I have a link to my uh, webpage. It's a discipleship ministry, but it's called BibleStudyCD.com. Click on that link. And there you can download my studies. The discipleship studies will teach you the basics of how to live the Christian life, how to study the Bible, how to you know, fight in the spiritual war, and how to, how to disciple others. There are other studies that get into the Bible, Ten Commandments, the books of Romans and Luke, uh, the study of God. So go there and, and, and download these free books, free materials, Study them so that you can go and teach it to others. You can download it and print it as many times as you want. Just go to the link below. But, I, but are you willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me. I pray you are. Because God is looking for people just like you, just like me, to go into this world and to say, Lord, you've touched my life. You've forgiven me. You've healed me, and I want to do the same to others around me and to the whole world before you come back. Because once Jesus comes back, it's over, and the door to his kingdom is closed. We have this one chance, this one opportunity, but I can see the sun is going down, and the harvest is plentiful, laborers are few, but the day is drawing to a close. We need to gather in the harvest now. Let us do it together. Ask God to send you into the harvest field. Go to my website and join me in winning people to Christ, building them and sending them out. I pray that you join me for this. With that, I say aloha no. I love you. And maalama pono. You take care. Amen.